Okay, I've just opened my observatory and turned all of my equipment on. First thing I'm going to do is launch Nina, and while that's launching, I'll also launch Microsoft Edge browser. I'm opening the browser because I need to go to Exaclock to see what objects are available tonight for um, exoplanet transits. Okay, so while that's loading the Exaclock project, I'm going to I'm on the equipment tab, and on the camera part of the equipment tab, I'm going to turn the camera on. It's turned on and I'm going to turn the cooling on. Now I'm going to click on the filter wheel and turn the filter wheel on. Okay, focuser, let's try connecting the focuser. It doesn't always work first time. That's a problem that I mentioned on the previous video. Once it fails, it will connect when I click it again. There we go, it's failed. So I'll click connect. There we go, it's connected properly now. Close them down there. So let's go, let's connect the driver. Is the driver connected? I can minimize this once it's loaded properly. Guider. I'll turn the guider on, but I'm actually not going to use it, I don't think. Get rid of that. And the weather. I'll just connect the weather service because I like that to be connected. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the sequencer. Now, because I do this slightly differently to how we're going to have it set up, I have to load in the exoplanet sequence. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to click the download so it can be downloading the exoplanets. And while it's doing that, I'm going to go to my schedule on Exoclock, click today, and let's have a look, see what's available. Make this full screen. Okay, so here are the, the objects that are available. Um, look down here, it's 2028 UT. Um, so these ones are all a bit too late because they've already started. And you can see here it actually says observation has started. This one hasn't started yet. It's um, a few minutes away. It's WASP 75B. It's at altitude 20. It's too low for me, so I'll ignore that one. It's priority three. There's a medium one here. It's altitude of 34, but it's in the north. It won't clear the observatory, so it's no good. One above gets a bit low towards the end, so it's no good either. Qatar 1B is pretty good. 43 degrees is a bit low in the northwest for me, but it's probably okay. Tres 3B, uh, this one, Wasp 93B, I don't think I've done that one before. It's quite bright, so almost oh, it's 11th magnitude, reasonably low dip at 9.6. Starts in a couple of hours' time, 69 degrees, going to 72, that's all nicely high. It's crossing the meridian, you can see, because it's going from east to west, but that shouldn't be too much of a problem. I think that is probably it, so I'd like to do this one, but it's just a little bit too low for me, I think. And it's a very bright 8th magnitude, so that's quite difficult when they're that bright, so I don't think I can do that one. Okay, so it's going to have to be, I'm going to do this one, WASP 93B. It's a 10.96 magnitude, so mag 11 star, and it's a 10 millimag drop. It doesn't start till 22.36, which is a couple of hours away. So it gives us plenty of time to look at um, explaining what I'm doing and uh, everything. So that's fine. So I'm in Nina now, and we said we was going to do WASP 93B. So here I can use this filter. I can type in... So I don't know if I can just do 93. Will that work? There we go. 93. It's the only one. So I selected 93B. This thinks it's 11.09 magnitude and it's a depth of 9.6. So let me just go through again with you exactly what um, what this script's going to do. Okay, so I've changed this sequence slightly since last time to try and make it a little simpler. Um, it's you can use these triangles to expand the sequence so that you can see what's happening. So this is at its um, least um, or at its most compressed, as it were. So this bit here connects the equipment and um, sets it up, calls it, autofocuses, and synchronizes the telescope so it knows where it's pointing. And you can see that's split into two sections. It's split into connecting equipment and it's split into cooling the camera, focusing and syncing. Now you can see that these two sequences differ in that this has got three dots in a row, whereas this one's got one dot that splits into three dots. What this means is that this one, it does the instructions one after the other, and the first instruction has to complete before it um, moves on to the next one. Whereas this one, 
it launches all the instructions at the same time, they still all need to complete before it will move on to this set here. But um, it allows you to sort of run more than one process at a time. So if we quickly look at connecting equipment, you can see this literally just connects all the different pieces of kit. So that should be reasonably easy to understand. And because I've got that little focuser issue, you can see here that it will try twice. Now, actually, we've already connected all the equipment, so it will run over that very quickly. Then this bit is actually split into two more sequences. And it's going to run this call camera at the same time that it runs the unpark, set tracking, set filter, slew and focus and sync commands. And um, that is because none of these commands down here um, require the camera to be completely cooled. Um, so it means you can be get on with the business of cooling the camera, which obviously we've already kicked off, but we could get on with the business of cooling the camera whilst we're doing these. Otherwise, if we hadn't done that, it would wait until all this is this is completed and the camera was at minus 10 before it started doing these things. Tonight, that's probably not much of an issue because we've got a couple of hours before the exoplanet transit starts. But um, some nights you might be only 10 minutes away and need to get it started. If we look at this one, um, then we can see it's going to unpark the telescope, set the tracking to sidereal, switch the filter to focus filter, slew the telescope to 70 degrees altitude and 90 degrees azimuth, autofocus the telescope then take some images and plate solve and sync the telescope driver to that position in the sky. Okay, let's just tidy this up, close these. It's then going to do the exoplanet sequence. And you can see the exoplanet sequence again. It's going to kick off two commands at the same time. Um, if we're really short for time, and it hasn't finished cooling, it will sit here, but you can click click a button which will show which will allow you to skip something, skip a command, and it would go here. And this basically just turns the cool camera camera command back on. But because it's in one of these um, parallel processing um, commands, it will cool the camera at the same time that it runs the exoplanet sequence. So we'll be running uh, taking images of the exoplanet while the camera is still cooling, which isn't ideal. Ideally, you'd have the camera at the same temperature, but it's probably better to have the images than to not have them. Here, um, I've already clicked this button to download the um, to download the exoplanet. I've already typed in 93 here to shorten this list so that actually there was only one in the list, which was WASP-93b, which, which was the exoplanet we were going to observe. And um, it's telling us it's 11th magnitude. It's got a depth of 9.6, which is quite, quite small. It's telling us lots of other information like the position and so on. And we can see that this is where we are now, this dotted line that the altitude's getting greater. It's going to transit um, about here. I'm sorry, it's going to reach the um, meridian about here. And then it's going to, the altitude's going to start dropping again. Um, and this is where the transit's occurring in this, this area here. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to go to the exoplanet, and then it will wait until the observation time. Um, so if we have a look at that, we can see it's going to do a slew and center. It's going to slew to these coordinates here. Um, it'll take images. It'll what? It'll then plate solve those images, and it'll slew again and keep doing that until it's decided it's close enough. Um, I don't guide, so it's going to stop guiding on the observatory telescope. This will say start guiding. And then it's going to wait until the observation time, which is 22:22, but I've offset it by 20 minutes, so it'll be 22. 02 and you can see at the moment it's 2045 but i'll show you how we can skip this and get started which we will do just to show you how to do it so once it's completed these commands it will then begin these commands and these commands will um 
basically just take an image every 120 seconds. I need to change that because that's going to be too too long an exposure for it. Mag 11 objects. I'm going to try 90, but I think that might also be a little bit too long, but we'll see. So it's going to take one image for 90 seconds. It's going to be an image type of light, which is just the type that gets used for light images. You can have flats, darks, biases, and so on. So that's why it's light. The binning is going to be one by one. I'm not touching the gain or the offset. And it's going to use the current filter, um, which was set earlier to the focus filter. It will do one of those. Once it's taken that image, these triggers will be um, triggered. And it will check to see if the filter has changed. And if it has, it will refocus. Um, that shouldn't occur when we're observing exoplanets. But if, um, if for some reason you decided perhaps the transit hasn't started properly and you decided to change the filter, then um, it, will, it will recognize it's occurred and do another autofocus for you. It will plate solve the image, look to see if it's drifting. And if it's drifted by too much, by more than one arc minute in this case, then it will recenter the telescope. And it will keep doing that as long as it's more than 30 degrees above the horizon and until the end of the until 256, which is the end of the observation. Once we get to the end of the observation, so let me just tidy this up. Once it gets to the end of the observation, it will then warn the camera and disconnect the camera. It will stop guiding part scope, warn the camera and disconnect. So we can quickly look at those. There we go, warm camera, disconnect camera. You see it's doing these. This is this parallel one again. So it's going to warm the camera and then and then once the warm camera is finished, it'll disconnect it. But at the same time as doing that, because it's in this box here, it will also start doing these commands, which is stopping the guiding. Um, disconnecting the guider, parking the telescope. Once the telescope's parked, it will disconnect the equipment, so it'll disconnect the telescope. It will disconnect the filter wheel, disconnect the focus zone, disconnect the weather service. And then that then the um the whole thing's safe. And that's the end of the observation. So what we're going to do is we're going to kick this off so we can start talking about the imaging tab. To kick this off, you just click play here. I'm going to click play here and it started. So if I go over to the imaging tab, we can start um, looking at what's happening. So this hit box here on the right hand side is the sequence that we've written. And you can see it's connected everything already because it was already all connected. The cooling of the camera has already occurred. Because ended. Cooling of the camera has already occurred because the because um, we'd started it quite early. It's unparked the telescope. It's set the tracking. It's changed the filter. It's already slewed to the, the um, 70 degrees altitude, 90 degrees azimuth, and it's running autofocus. And this box has appeared. The autofocus I've programmed to do four second exposures. So it'll do a four second exposure. And then it'll analyze the image. So um, let's put this on here. That's the image it's taken. Just make this a bit bigger. And we've got a little dot here. So basically, it's um, saying th this here is showing the position of the filter wheel, sorry, of the focuser. And this is showing the um, half full radius, which is a, a measure of the shape of the star um, and how tightly focused it is. And it's moving the start, the focus in this direction at the moment. And you can see it's the focus is getting better and better. It's gone past the best and it's starting to get worse again. And this little gray dot is showing where the best focus is. And eventually it will work out that it's gone too far and it will bring it back to the best focus. So we'll just watch that happen. And basically, don't touch anything, just let this happen. 
he's showing error bars, these little bars of the error bars. So it's auto focused. We just move this here. You can see it's found that the final auto focus was 2.74 degrees. It's already done this plate solve. This is my driver software. You won't see this on your on the Mead. I just need to click Offset OK. And it. So it's taken an image. It knows where it is. And if we look over here at the sequence, I can hear the telescope's just slewed. Slew ended. It said go to exoplanet. It's just finished slewing. And it's now taking an image. And it's going to plate solve that image. There we go. There's the image. It's plate solved it. It wants me to confirm it. Offset and it. And down Slew here, ended. we can see that it was four, four arc minutes out from where it needed to be. So it slewed the telescope again. It's taking another image and it will plate solve that. And you can see now it's three arc seconds out from where it needs to be, which is within within tolerance. So it will um, it will leave it there. And you can see now it's sitting at this weight for transit observation. And we know the transit observation um, was about 10, 20, I think, from, from what I remember I said earlier. Um, so the star, the exoplanet, will be this star here right at the very center. Now, um, we're on, see here on this image, this shows the image. We can go to a one-to-one -one pixel like that. Um, or we can um, show the whole image, or we can use these to zoom in, um, in and out, like so. Uh, we can put crosshairs on, and there we go. There's the center star. That's the star that we've um, that, that's that we're um, interested in. Um, now, whilst we I'm not going to wait for this transit observation to start. I'm going to start it straight away um, because there are there will be occasions where you want to actually start the observation early or, or perhaps it's cooling and you want to skip over it. And you can see you've got these waiting signs saying it's waiting for something to complete. And you just go down to the last one. You can see it's this one it's waiting to complete. So I can skip over that by click, clicking this button. It will just skip it. Um, so I'm going to do that. And basically now it's moved straight to um, the exposure of 90 seconds. And down here at the bottom left, you can say you can see that it's imaging, it's exposing for 13, 14, 15 seconds out of 100 and one minute 30 seconds. It's got a little progress bar here, it shows you how far um, it's come, and it's going to expose. What I'm going to do while it's while I'm waiting is I'm going to press Windows and E. That brings up File Explorer and I'm going to go to the Nina images and the light images. And once Nina has taken an image, it will be um, it will create a folder for it and we'll see it here. So I'll leave this up here. And wait for the observation to finish, which will be in a few seconds. So it saved the image. Um, if I just show the whole image again, you can see here that it's identified some stars and showing me the the half full radius of those stars. Um, Best it gets is about 2.7 on my telescope, so 2.8, 2.9 is slight, slightly soft focus. Um, that will be down to conditions rather than anything else. Now here, there's a couple of things. We've got an image history, so I can see the image. You know, this will build up with lots of um, little thumbnails. When I move over here, you get this little thumb up. If I click it, it will go to thumb down and it will mark the um, image is bad and it will prepend the file name with the word bad. Um, so that can be quite useful if you look at something and think there's something wrong with that. I'm just going to click bad and then you can filter them quite easily afterwards. 
The HFR history is quite good as well. I've got it set up to show the HFR, which is the half full radius. So it's, the, it's that focusing parameter. That's this on the left. And I've got the number of stars on the right. So it's showing what, five, six, seven, eight, almost 900 stars it's found in the image. And it will draw this graph over the night and you'll be able to see how it progresses. Here we go. It's just another image. That image, um, there's even more stars. Now, what I'm going to do is go over to the um, File Explorer. Here's our star, WASP93B. Here's the date. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to keep updating these two CSV files, which you can open in Excel, but don't do it while it's running. These just have some additional data for you about the observation. It will give you the file name, what, how good the focus was, how many stars it found, some of the parameters um, of the of the image and so on can can be useful data to use later um, and you've got the actual images now what we want to do is one make sure we are actually on wasp 93b even though it's plate solved and it says that's where we are we want to double check that with an independent source what we also want to do is see if wasp 93b is actually bright enough and not too bright so I'm going to look at the first one, I double click on it. Um, double clicking on it is going to open Astro Image J. Here we go. Just going to put that down there. I'm going to do it so I can see the whole image. And then I'm going to move to the middle, that star there, I'm going to double click on it. And it just zooms in. Now, how this looks it is a bit deceptive. I wouldn't worry about that. If you change um, these little sliders here, it will change how it looks. We're not really that interested in how it looks. What we're interested in is the statistics of it. The first thing I'm going to do is hold down the Alt key and left click. And it's going to give me a profile. And you can see here, I've got a graph, the shape of that star, and you can see that it's getting up to 60,000, which is the maximum number. 64,000 is the maximum number of um, counts I can have, and it's hitting it. So this is too bright. Um, so the choices I've got are to reduce the length of the exposure or to change the focus. Now, my um, preference would be to defocus a little bit. Another way of looking at that, when you do this, it's always good to then save the aperture because it's measured the aperture for you. So if you save the aperture when you do measurements, it will use the radius of seven pixels. So we can close that. I can hold down the shift key and left click. And it brings up the measurements. And there's a whole load of bump in here. But if we cycle to the right, there's some interesting stats. And these are the two that are important. We've got the source signal to noise ratio, which is 887, which is massive. It's really good. But you can see the peak is 57,000 picks, 57,000 counts, which is far too high. I want to get this into the um, 40s, really, or 35, something like that. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and defocus a little. So you can see that it's the thing still running, and I've now taken four images. I'm going to leave it running, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back onto Nina. Here is the focusing controls. I'm going to click this focuser. Now, for me, um, it there it's going to be different on the Crayford one. We're going to have to work out what the right amount of focus is. I'm going to click this three times, I think. One, it's moving the focus up. Two, three. Now, what I'm going to do is, this has just started another exposure. So we'll measure the next exposure. And I'm actually going to mark all of these as bad. 
because the, the star is too bright. However, one other thing that I can do with this is I can click this little button here and it will go off and plate salt this and just confirm for me that this is the star that we're looking for. Wasp, was it 93? Was it something like that? Wasp 93B, I think it was. Yeah, Wasp 93B. So we'll wait for that to plate salt. It'll tell me once it's plate salt. But what we're really interested in is the next image that comes in. You can see here it's now changed all these to bad and I can delete these before I do any processing. Right, here's the new image. So if I double click on that, it will open again in AIJ. Now if I hit shift and then the left mouse key and then go back to the measurements tab, there's the second measurement. Um, and the peak is still too high. It doesn't look like it's changed at all. So I'm going to move the focuser again. Now, if we look here at the um, HFR, you can see that it's the HFR actually got better. What we want is this green line to go up so that it gets more defocused, which will mean that the number of stars that you count go down, which isn't an issue because there are so many of them, um, but it'll just reduce the overall peak brightness here we go this is now 3.4 this is much this is much more like what we want um, probably don't want it any wider than that so let's open that one up it's opened so let's open it here shift click now let's go to the measurements tab and we've got a peak of 50 which is still a bit too high so i think we are going to have to don't really want to increase the PSF anymore I think we are going to have to reduce the exposure time as you can see here the focus has changed it's gone up the number of stars have gone down so it's exactly as we'd expect so I'm going to, going to reduce this exposure time so the sequence is running but I can still change the um, parameters in the sequencer while it's running and it will just affect the next command so I'm going to go down here still way before the time that it would need to start so I'm going to change this to 60 seconds I don't like to do things at 80 seconds so I'll change that to 60 once it's finished this exposure it's just I just missed it it's 13 seconds into a one and a half minute exposure this will change to 60 seconds so if I go back to the imaging tab go to the image history and I'm just going to mark these ones as bad as well if we go back to um, the log, the log is saying that the plate solving has been finished. So I go back to that original one and now right click on it. It's going to open the browser and tell me what star it is. And it's WASP 93B, which is exactly what we wanted it to be. So we know it's an independent, an independent proof that we we're on the right one. That's good. Okay, so I can close that. Don't need that anymore. Don't need the log. Close that. I can close all of these for now. I'm going to wait for this one to finish. We'll mark the next one as bad as well. It looks like I've got a bit of drift as well. I so I need to turn the guiding on. I can do that with the guider here. Select some stars. Start guiding. Now this will be useful because it will also show you what happens. So normally you wouldn't need to start the guiding from the guider. Um, but I've had all the guiding turned off in my sequence, it won't be on yours. This area, the graph here, or the screen here, shows the guiding. Um, normally the guiding has to settle down and then it will carry on. But we'll see the, the correction pulses coming in here and the measurement of how far out the guiding is. So um, we'll see them coming in. I have it so it guides about once every 15 seconds. Um, it will be different on, on the Peter, Peter Hindle telescope. OK. Um, this is the plate solving failing. Um, just click OK. I'm not sure why it does this. It all still works. And if even if you ignore it and don't, it'll just carry on working. I'm not sure why it's doing that. It's a little bug that I've not quite worked out. So we're 34 seconds into one minute exposure. Just check that I hadn't already done another minute exposure. Yeah, it has. So um, if I just expand this a little, let's see what's going on here. So these images, we've got the name of the 
name of the object, the filter we're using, the date, the time, and then the exposure time. And you see this one here is a 60 second exposure. I'm going to click, double click on that one. That will open in Astro Image J. This is the star we're interested in. If we shift and left click, it brings up the measurements. We can now look at these measurements, go across to the right until we find the source signals noise 700 and the peak 28,000. That's perfect. This is a really high signal to noise ratio, so I'm quite happy with that. And the peak of 28,000. 500 is, is it's a nice size peak you know up to about 35 is okay if it starts to move towards 40 I, I start to get a little bit twitchy so that is fine you can see there's an error here and it's basically saying it can't send the image to light bucket i use something called light bucket to record my imaging sessions this is because this is this failing because of my internet access um which i've got to fix sometime so don't worry about that you won't get that so this is good now what i would do in a typical observing run now obviously this is um we are we've started well over an hour earlier than we needed to but what i would do is i would constantly check these for a good half an hour just clicking on the images getting the measurement, checking the peaks here, and just looking to see if there's any trends occurring. You know, is, are they getting brighter and brighter? Um, are they getting, you know, dimmer? Is there just some, is there anything going on that means that it, I'm not gonna have a successful observation? Um, so let's shift, click on that one. So I've just done those last two measurements, and you can see that last two peaking at 31, that's fine. This one's a little bit lower than that one. The signal to noise is about the same for them all. And I'll just keep checking these. Another one's come in. Look, let's do that one as well. Just shift click. This one's a little bit brighter. You know, the trend is getting brighter still. We just need to just check that's not going to go over. And I'll just keep doing this until I've satisfied myself that everything's settled down. And I'm go I, it's not going to change a lot. I, I'm looking for this not to go up above about 45 at the, at the worst. And obviously, the seeing and the shape of the stars means that sometimes you get a slightly higher, brighter spot. These are defocused, these stars, um, because you remember we defocused. You can see that, you know, 3.36, 3.32. These are very defocused stars for my setup. Now, I'm just going to mark that 90 second one as bad and all all of these ones are good so on here it's showing us the mean which is effectively the sky background brightness the half full um, radius the filter that was used how long the observation was and the time of the observation if i wanted to look at this particular one i just just um double click on it and it'll show it to me um, it's not, you can just go through them if you want to. It'll automatically repopulate the. Um, there you go. It's just sort of repopulated a new one. Um, so down here you can see the guiding. So we have the little bars are the corrections. So it's currently doing a correction about every 30 seconds, uh, maybe once a minute sometimes. Um, and then this is the measured deviation. You can see it's deviating by what, a total of 0.39 arc seconds at the moment. Um, given that the seeing is about two arc seconds, I'm happy with that. I'm happy that there's nothing, nothing's going wrong. It's doing what it should do. Um, so that's good. Let's go back to these. Let's just open these ones up. Let's open it. Let's shift click and then let's go to the measurements tab. See that's 29. It's gone down again. That's fine. And we'll just check it again. I've done one in there now. Check all of these. 
and then I think we'll leave it as probably it's all okay. Shift click, see another one's popped in here. 32, that's fine. Let's try this one. Shift click, 29. So this is fine, it's, it's flickering around the 29 to 31 to 32 type level for peaks. The signal to noise is reasonably static. And we know that it's getting higher, so it's going to likelihood the signal to noise is going to improve because the sky is going to get darker as we get higher, um, which will improve the signal to noise. We'll be going through less air as well, so it's likely to get brighter slightly. But I think that that should be fine where it is now. Um, OK, so I'm going to close all of the AIJ stuff, which I can do just by closing AIJ itself. I'm going to minimize that because I don't need it. Um, and there isn't much more to take you through, really. If you wanted to stop the telescope, you could click the button here. Um, you could park it by clicking here. But you don't really need to use these. I just like to have the controls of all the equipment on the screen, but you're not really going to use it. The main thing that I tend to be looking at now are these. Um, focus stats which you know if you was imaging you'd be concerned about this but I'm not overly concerned this is the histogram you can see because we only got stars in the picture it's all up one end if we had um, more nebulosity then then it would be a, have a bit more shape to it um, if we click this we can see that the sensor temperature is at minus 10, the cooling power is at 31%. Um, we don't need to touch that, it's just doing what it does. We're obviously already imaging automatically, but if you wanted to manage the imaging manually, um, then you can click on this imaging tab and control the camera there, but it's all doing it all automatically at the moment. And you can see we've got another five hours, 37 minutes before it's gonna finish. Remember we started very early, so we're going to have a long lead in to the um, to the observation, which is fine. It doesn't do any harm to be slightly early. Um, it just means we have more data to deal with. The good thing that I like about Nina compared to other software is we haven't had to tell Nina how many images to take. And in most software, you have to go, okay, I'm doing a 45 second exposure and I need to keep exposing for five hours, 23 minutes. So I'm going to try and work out well, how many exposures would that be and then tell it to do that many exposures. When it's late at night, that can be quite complicated and difficult to do um, because your brain's not necessarily fully engaged. Um, with Nina, you just say image for 45 seconds until this time. And it'll just do it. And you can see that the tracking's now settled down, and it's you know this is this this is pretty good. 0.33 arc seconds. That's pretty typical for my telescope. I do get days when this goes right down to 0.1 of an arc second, um, but it's not doing that today for some reason. But this is pretty typical. And basically, you just have to look after the telescope and monitor it like this until the end of the observation. Then it'll park itself and that's it really um once you've got all your data the next part will be talking about um how you process that data to get your exoplanet exoclock timings